Welcome everyone. This is the ninth session of our book club on the Federalist Papers. Tonight is on the presidency, but before we go there, we've got two questions from the live audience. The first one is a follow-up by Dave. He asked me about a document called uh, the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress. He was worried about it. And he good skepticism on his part. It has 97 provisions in it. And these are not statutes at this point. These are recommendations as far as I can tell. The one, if they ever did it, would seem to be good. And that was that they would write bills in such a way as you could see what they were repealing. I may have mentioned to you before, I think it did in a previous session that the uh, Congress, unlike most of the states, they don't simply X out what the old law is and give you the new law. They make it much more complicated than that, but that's good. But one of the things I want to say, and, and this justifies Dave's skepticism, is that remember Madison in 48 said, it is against the legislative body that you impose all your precautions. And here is an example right in the text of the constitution, because most people don't realize that there are two quote, presentment clauses in Article one, section seven, why would that be? Okay, so let's read the first part of the first one. Every bill, and that's the key word, which shall have been passed, it has to be pre uh, presented to the president. Then the next one says, every order, resolution, or vote to which the Constitution, uh, concurrence of the Senate and the House uh, of representatives may be necessary. And, and he takes out the adjournment because that wouldn't have been covered by bills, but it would be covered by this language. Why did he do that? Because always suspicious of what legislators would do, he said, look, what they're gonna do is not call it a bill and they're going to run it through calling it something else and claim they don't have to get the per permission of the president. Well, <laughs> Congress actually did that, but in a more devious way. Those of you who have been to law school and gone through constitutional law, you've heard of the Chada case, the, the line item veto case. Well, that's what Congress did. It passed laws that included within them what's so-called line item veto, which meant that if Congress didn't like something the president did under that law, it could quote veto it, either depending on the statute, by one house vote or two house votes. Supreme Court rightly said that that violated the presentment clause. But never underestimate the ability of members of Congress to twist, to try to get around the Constitution in order to achieve whatever it ends they want. In the case of Chad, it was all about power as usual. They wanted to make the president responsible, but when they didn't like something he did, they were going to hold back the ability to, to do it. Never mind that the fact is that Congress still attempts to do that. So we have another question, this one from Barbara. The discussions that contrast the beliefs of Publius with term limits are very misguided in current respects as our Senate is not following the original, uh, the original compact in, uh, in selection of senators. I agree, we all agree, and there are problems with this. But I'm not gonna argue about it. I'm gonna ask you these very practical questions. Supreme Court has held that term limits violate the constitution. That means to overturn it, you've gotta get an amendment to the constitution that's either proposed by Congress or by the other method of the convention method. So you've gotta get then three uh, quarters. We've got a misspelling there, courts, three courts. Three quarters of the states to agree. Now, the real question is, what arguments would persuade legislators that term limits will improve the situation? Well, you might cynically say, we don't have to make arguments. The people who want it will just force it on them. Well, wait a minute, it doesn't actually work that way. For one thing, many of the state legislatures have already imposed on their legislators term limits. And if somebody is in their last term, that person doesn't care about rerunning at least for that office again. Now, if the person is gonna run for Congress, of course, he or she is likely to support it. But the reality is that many of the state legislators don't like term limits either for them 
or for others because they understand the problems. Now, the Federalist argues that a republic needs a body different from the House, one which is smaller so that its members are able to engage in deliberation, whose members have sufficient knowledge, due in part to longer terms of service, to be able to make good policy, and which institution projects a national character of competence and stability. I would not say that our Senate for some years now has projected that image. And I think it's destabilizing to the country. Remember, the whole world watches everything the United States does on cable. And a lot of our people who are speaking are not speaking to the world, not that they should be, but the world is watching. And many well-educated people in other countries know our constitution much better than the typical American. So under this circumstance, is it possible and desirable for us, the Senate to reflect those qualities which did exist as described by de Tocqueville? Well, if so, how would a constitutional amendment proposing term limits move the Senate in that direction? And I think the Senate needs to be moved in that direction. But so if it's not important to move the Senate that way, if you don't care about that, outlined by the Federalists, in what direction would term limits move the Senate? What does our understanding of human nature tell us? The problem with term limits and many other proposals that people come up with is they don't think out the consequences. And you can't figure out the consequence, consequences without wargaming, as if you will, the likely motivations and reactions of those who are affected. So now we turn to the presidency. Now, this is important because of the relationship between Congress and in particular with the Senate and the presidency. The difficulty of creating the executive, look, that was the big problem because they knew there would be opposition to a strong executive. On the other hand, they were absolutely convinced that you have to have a strong executive. From the beginning, the critics, the anti-federalists, have argued that the presidency as created is, quote, like a king. Now, in detail, power by power in part of the federalists that we're not actually uh, putting in the slides, the, uh, the federalist goes point by point and shows how this is not true. Writers against the Constitution seem to have taken pains to signal their uh, intent of misrepresentation the aversion of the people to monarchy. That's what they've always used. And you've heard that in recent decades. I mean, it was used against George Bush. It was used even more strongly against President Trump. I mean, he wanted to be, be a dictator, et cetera. To establish the pretended affinity, they have not scrupled to draw resources even from the regions of fiction. Now, in the ellipse that I'm not covering, is a beautiful piece of rhetoric. It really is. It's just we don't have time to go through it. But what he does is he goes on and he says, the temerity has proceeded so far as to ascribe to the President of the United States a power which the instrument reported is expressly allotted to the executives of the individual states. Now, what follows is a great textual argument. I mean, it's one of the most complete arguments from a lawyer's point of view that you could have. And he's at pains to make this argument. And you can see original textualism in everything he says. He's going through the text. And, and what does the second clause of the second section say? It empowers the president of the United States to nominate and buy and with advice and consent. So the critics were saying, well, if, if a senator drops out for whatever reason, the president gets to nominate a replacement for a period of time, but not in the constitution otherwise provided for. That is, this is language. He goes on to say, this is provided for. Se the appointment of senators is provided for by states. A slight um, attention to the um, concession of the clause, connection of the clauses, and for the obvious meaning of the terms will satisfy us that the, the uh, deduction is not even colorable. So he's arguing from 
inferences, first of all. First of these two clauses is clear, whose appointments are not otherwise provided for in the Constitution. And senators are, so that doesn't cover. Specific text that refutes the argument. And this is where he goes on at length. The last of these two clauses is equally clear. It cannot be understood to comprehend the power of filling vacancies in the Senate for the following reasons. First, the relation in which the clause stands to the other, which declares the general mode of appointing officers of the United States, denotes it to be nothing more than a supplement to the other, skipping down. But lastly, the first and the second clause of the third section of the first article obviate all possibility of doubt. And he goes down to the quote that I referred to already. If vacancies in that body should happen by resignation or otherwise during the recess of legislatures of any state, the executive therefore may make temporary appointments until the next meeting of the legislature, which shall be fill such vacancies. They're arguing that the recess appointments law is also vacancy. But here he goes on. I've taken the pains to select this instance of misrepresentation and to place it in a clear and strong light as an unequivocal proof of the unwarrantable arts of argument they're using. Nor have I scrupled in so flagrant a case to indulge a severity of animadversion, little congenial with the general spirit of these papers. In other words, he's really passionate on this point. He's getting a little excited more so than he generally is. I hesitate not to submit to the decision of any candid and honest adversary of the proposed government, whether the language can furnish epithets for the, for, of too much asperity for those shameless and so prostitute an attempt to impose on the citizens of America. Now, that's all tamed by modern argument, but for that time, it was rather strong argument. So the question is from Anthony. He says that section or essay 67 does a good job of attacking um, the, the attack on the president as, as a um, you know, progeny of the detested parent. This is a problem, and I think I mentioned it early on, that in Czechoslovakia, and I'm sure it happens in other countries, where they come out of some form of dictatorship, they are very reluctant to put power into a single person. They are afraid of it. And they should be afraid of it unless they have properly restrained it. And that's why the first slide talked about in this essay, the difficulty they had in on the one hand, giving sufficient energy, and on the other hand, making sure the president could not get out of hand. They were well aware of Caesar crossing the Rubicon and they did everything they could to avoid that situation. So he mentions, um, Anthony does, by focusing on the appointment power, Hamilton introduces the executive by highlighting both separation of powers, advice and consent. That is, remember, we'll see what we can talk about now that they had gone back and forth in the convention what, to whom to give the uh, power of appointment. Originally, they were gonna let the appointments in the executive branch be made by the house. That would have been a disaster. Then they moved it to the Senate. Then they moved it to the president alone. And the compromise was to have the president nominate and the Senate confirm as a check. And that check is not that the president doesn't get to nominate, even if he loses on a particular nominee. It was especially designed against cronyism. In other words, people who really weren't competent. And Congress controls what officers of the United States are subject to being confirmed and what, if you read the appointments clause, which ones Congress can allow the president to appoint without advice and consent. Senate appointment power, both regular and fill in the vacancies, effectively 
ensuring that the president would not be an unchecked despot. You know, you, you say a lot of things about presidents, but their big problem, both during Trump and in, as Biden is finding out payback time, they are getting a difficult time getting their cabinet officers through. And the key to running an executive agency is to having your people in there. The problem is that under Trump, the people in the agencies were generally democratic or liberal leaning, and they continued the Obama policies. And not that many Trump appointees got in. So once the Trump appointees are out, even though they're slowing down the Biden appointees, still there are plenty of like-minded people in the bureaucracy carrying on essentially the Obama policies. So Federalist 68. The Electoral College. Now think of this in light of the fact that the Electoral College has come under so much attack. And the reason for the attack is because people who want centralized power know that that's the main barrier still in the way of centralized power. The mode of appointment of the Chief Magistrate of the United States is almost the only part of the system of any consequence which has escaped without severe censure, or which has received the slightest mark of approbation from its opponents. That's remarkable from our point of view, maybe. But they wanted it in the states, and that's where it was, that the election of the president is pretty well guarded. We'll talk more about that as we go through this. If the manner of it be not perfect, it is at least excellent. Now. There are reasons why they might not consider it perfect because in the Senate, uh, they wanted to have it based on population. And if it had been based on population, the bigger states would have gotten more electoral votes. So that is probably the reason he's saying it's probably not perfect. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about this past election, which was an amazing election as we all know. And it's important for people to understand because the media never, fully described it. And that is, for instance, they said that uh, Vice President Pence was being asked to overturn the election in favor of President Trump. Maybe President Trump was arguing that, but those who argued, and I know, who argued to Pence and his legal counsel argued that because of the uncertainty in many of the states, the matter should be sent back to the states, why? Here is article two, section one right here. Each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct. The problem was under the COVID pandemic, many states engaged through the executive branch in actions that were completely inconsistent with the statutes passed by the legislature. Now, the courts didn't take up this argument if it was even made at all. I don't know. I didn't look at all these cases. But that was the argument made to Pence. I know that. And this, the legislatures were not even in session, many of them, at the time when these uh, critical votes were taken. So the request to send it back to the states was perfectly consistent uh, with the Constitution. Eight, includes the sense of the people and by those capable of addressing the candidate's qualities. So from the beginning, there has to be a sense of the people, even though at the beginning, there wasn't necessarily popular election. It was up to each state, and certainly in the slave states, uh, slaves and Others were not getting represented in a way of being able to vote in any sense. It was desirable that the sense of the people should operate in the choice of the person. Committing the right of making it not to any pre-established body, but to men chosen by the people for the special purpose. Now, a lot of criticism has said, well, you know, the idea that these electors were going to be acting on their own is no longer true given the party discipline. Yes, but the point remains, it is a separate body. And the founders understood that you have to keep things 
away from those who already hold political office. That was key. They didn't want this going to state legislatures. Yes, the state legislatures got to make the rules, but it was an independent body. It was equally desirable that the uh, immediate election should be made by men most capable of analyzing the qualities adopted to this station. You may say, well, that's no longer true. They don't do that, but wait a minute. Many of you, probably most of you, aren't old enough to remember what the world was like in politics prior to the spread of, of primaries, especially, but also caucuses. That's not the way presidential candidates were chosen. They were chosen in what critics call smoke-filled rooms, <laughs> okay? That's the way John F. Kennedy was chosen. Delegates from different states went and they got together and they figured out who can get elected and who can actually govern. In other words, they were actually looking for competence. Competence, a novel concept. All of that changed with the, with the expansion of primaries, especially. So the action that he's talking about persisted for a very long time. It just didn't occur necessarily uh, at the stage of the elector, electoral college because they had already been determined. And when the party cho chooses their own slate of electors, it's all based on what's already been decided, quote, in the smoke-filled rooms. <sighs> what they're really concerned about is the need to avoid cabal, chaos, and corruption. It was, a, it was also peculiarly desirable to afford as little opportunity as possible to tumult and disorder. Well, guess what? We've forgotten all about that. I'll give you some examples in just a minute. Nothing was more to be desired than every practicable obstacle should be opposed to cabal, intrigue, and corruption. And it was chiefly, nope, they were worried about foreign powers. That hasn't changed. We're still worried about foreign powers. And it's not just Russia, it's China, Iran, Cuba. When you look into this, you find out they're all got their attempts to influence. I'm not saying they're effective, but they are attempting it. That's pretty clear. Okay, peculiarly desirable. The difficulty or the aim was to divide the electoral colleges in, uh, in divide it up in such a way that you couldn't control all the states. Even if you had corruption in one state, you weren't going to have a cabal among the states. What they didn't want was the election being determined by a centralized organ. Yes, Congress was right that it's the states that's supposed to determine this. The problem is it's the state legislature rules that are supposed to determine that. And Congress got that mixed up. But even worse, what people don't understand is that three voting machine companies control virtually all the elections in this country. And apparently they all use the same software. And when you get into those machines, you find out you can't get into those machines. They are protected by contract made with state officials. The reality is that when people talk about audits and recounts, they're not recounting the way you do on either the old machines or hand ballots. And in attempts that are being made to figure this out and changes that are being made in the States, they're coming to realize that it actually takes you a very long time to figure out what goes on in these machines. The transparency that we knew for years is gone at this point. And that is a very real concern. Nothing was more to be desired than that every practicable obstacle should be uh, opposed to the cabal. That is worth uh, rem reminding us over and over again, the idea that three companies 
that are in part, some of them controlled by foreign elements, have gotten a hold of our elections and you can't completely look into the machines is an amazing development that has not been fully brought to the American people's attention, chiefly from the desire of foreign powers. Again, this cannot be overemphasized. Practical precautions to protect integrity of the elections of the president. The convention have guarded against the danger of the sort. They have not made the appointment of the president to depend on pre-existing bodies of men, we've already said that, who might be tampered with further down. They have excluded from eligibility to this trust all those who from situations which might be suspected of too great devotion to the president. They're thinking about human motivation everywhere. Where can the system be biased? That kind of thought does not go on today in the secretaries of state and it doesn't go on in Congress. And that's why we are in great danger right now. President should be dependent only on the people. The executives should be independent from continuance in office on all but the, the people themselves. Otherwise, he may be uh, tempted to sacrifice his duty of the complacence to those whose favor was necessary to, for his duration in office. This is a problem with all parliamentary systems. And terribly enough, uh, there are many American officials who want a parliamentary system. Some years ago, a bipartisan group, largely establishment Republicans and Democrats, called to scrap our constitution and go to a parliamentary system. This was back in the 80s. You know, this is part of the progressive movement. So many of these Republicans are simply the right wing of the progressive movement. The president needs to be chosen by a majority. Now, this is very important. Even when a president is, uh, doesn't get the popular vote, he or in the future, she has to win, first of all, if possible, a majority of the Electoral College. But if that's not possible, then it goes to the House of Representatives. And he says, the House of Representatives shall select the man when their opinion may be best qualified for the office. And how do they vote? They vote with each state in the, in the House, its delegation getting only one vote. So they're only, if it goes to the House, there are only 50 votes. And one of the things that was up for consideration in all this, had it been such that you really couldn't tell who won the popular vote, and therefore you couldn't tell that either candidate had enough of the electoral vote, then it would have gone into the House where the Republicans had an advantage of one or two, two delegations. So there were a lot of scenarios that could have played out and didn't play out. And it may be for that reason that many were even more worried than they were about what the consequences to the stability of the country might be. Rarely will the president not possess the requisite qualifications. That may or may not be true today for some of the reasons that I've already mentioned and how the process works today. But there were times in the 19th century in particular when it didn't work, and I'll talk about that. Talents for low intrigue and the little arts of popularity may alone suffice to elevate a man to the first honors of a state, but it will require other talents and a different kind of merit to establish him to the esteem and confidence of the whole union or of a considerable portion of it as it would be necessary to make him a successful candidate for the distinguished office of president of the United States. Think about it. There are some state governors who are very popular for a time, and then they go into the convention process, uh, not the convention, the, the um, primary process, and in public debates, they get destroyed or eliminated for whatever reason. So if we're gonna have the system we have with primaries and all, it is certainly important that they be out there and that they be challenged and while they may be perfectly good as governors or as senators, it doesn't mean they're going to make good 
chief executives for the United States. So Warren has a number of comments. I'll just read some of them. Given recent calls for abolishing the Electoral College, it was striking to read you know, how it, it was well regarded. Next, on the contrary to radical attempts to um, swell the voters' rolls, he's referencing HR1, Hamilton emphasized the importance of the Electoral College. I've gone through all of that, I think. Next, Hamilton also addressed the risk of formeddling in our presidential elections, perhaps in today's day and age, influencing electors who exercise voting discretion is harder than influencing other voters. That may be, I just, I just don't know, but thank you for your comments. Federalist 70, okay. This is on the energetic presidency. There is an idea, which is not without its advocates, that a vigorous executive is incumbent inconsistent with the genius of Republican government. Okay, this is the anti-federalist mentality. And at this point, the progressives have carried that idea forward to today. Skipping down, energy in the executive is a leading character in the definition of good government. As I said, I think in the last class, uh, their ideas of good government and the ideas of good government of many people today are completely different. A lot of good government people are frankly very spacey. They want ethics in government and they don't pay any attention to all of the opportunities for corruption and their solutions often like the independent council action simply do not correspond to an understanding of human nature and the use of power. It is essential to the protection of the community against foreign attacks it is not less essential to the steady administration of the laws. Foreign attacks, critical. Ronald Reagan hit his highest point of popularity when he pulled a jet down from Libya in the Mediterranean. George Bush was thought to be unbeatable after he won in Iraq, won. But people have short memories also, but it is true that people rightly know that only the president ultimately can protect the country. Yes, the military, of course, but he is commander in chief. A weak commander in chief can be destructive to the country, especially these days. In the 19th century, we could get away with it, but not anymore. The steady administration of the laws, um, you know, we've talked a lot about how Congress has, in fact, put in all kinds of statutes, too many statutes. As a result, we don't really have the rule of law. We have the rule of a bunch of rules that nobody knows. And they have to hire lawyers and pay them expensive bills in order to get any kind of expertise. And that's only really affordable by large corporations. So that is a bad situation. But when you have a president who comes along and who understands and tells the people he's gonna enforce certain laws. And we know not all the laws can be or should be enforced. So the steady administration of the laws is certainly an important thing. Good government requires energetic executive. A feeble executive implies a feeble execution of the government. Look at your failed states, your weak states. They have executives that don't have sufficient power. In Central America, I think I've mentioned that before. You know, they're small countries, they don't have a lot of wealth. They don't have the firepower that the drug gangs have. And so they are enfeebled, even if they are strong persons because they don't have control of enough power to defend the state. Skipping down. What are the ingredients consist, consist, uh, uh, which cons constitutes this energy? There are four, unity, one of the most important. Duration, we know about that, four years. An adequate provision for support, critical. Competent powers. Now, energy requires a unitary executive. The left is completely against a unitary executive. And given that most of the people in the media are on the left, the way they always describe this is to say so-and-so 
believes in the theory of the unitary executive as if he believes in some kind of strange ideology. Here it is, decision, activity, secrecy in dispatch will generally characterize the proceedings of one man. Unfortunately, we have too many leaks in all presidencies, and this is dangerous to the country. It's embarrassing to the country, and other countries come to distrust us. Their phone calls and whatever they say, they become public matters in the United States and therefore also in their own countries. In proportion as the numbers increase, these qualities will be diminished. Look, anybody in business or even academia knows this. Where there are more than where there is more than one person in charge, there are very few co-executives in corporations. Whether they can work or not, I don't know. But the idea of two strong-willed people sharing the same title or splitting a title and exercising power, in my view, it is a prescription for disaster. There are two ways of destroying the unity. Unity may be destroyed by two ways, either by vesting the power in two or more magistrates. That in the Soviet Union, they had their famous troikas, three, and eventually one knocked off the other two. Executives do not like competition. They want to control the power. Or by vesting it ostensibly in one man, subject in whole or in part, to the control and cooperation of others, and what the left and the anti-federalists have always attempted to get. And of course, the 25th Amendment, he goes on to say that most opponents really want a council of advisors. Well, this actually happened in the 19th century. The, um, the voters of the executive councils are the most numerous. They are both liable, if not to equal, to similar elections. So I have done here to discuss Tippecanoe Canoe and Tyler too. Harrison only lasted a month because he gave a long inaugural address, got a cold and died within a month. And Vice President Tyler took over. Tyler learned, or maybe he knew already, that Tippecanoe, unbelievably, had agreed with senators that they would have a council and that he, the president, would get one vote and all the others could outvote him. That's exactly what some people want. It was a disaster, but only for a month. Tyler completely changed that. He said, First of all, they called him acting president. He said, no, I am president. And they wanted the council. He said, no, there's no council. Well, after that, they simply threw him out of the party. The historians don't rate Tyler very highly. I give Tyler a very high rating. Why? He did what Madison said he should do in Federalist 51, defend the office. He defended the presidency. He didn't allow it to simply become like a parliamentary system. Non-unitary executive weakens its authority. Basically, what you have is conflict. You don't know where anything, who is responsible. Whenever two or more persons are engaged in any common enterprise or pursuit, there is always a danger of difference of opinion. Surprise, surprise. If it be a public trust or office in which they are clothed with equal dignity and authority, there is peculiar danger of personal emulation and even animosity from either and especially from all causes, the most bitter dissensions are apt to spring. They lessen the respectability, weaken the authority, and distract the plans and operations of those whom they do. Again, going back to the Troikas, that's what happened. Men often oppose a thing merely because they have no agency or planning in it, or because it may have been planned by those whom they dislike. 
Well, it's often said that every senator thinks that he or she could be a better president than the existing president. And those who are running for office in either party or both parties, depending on who is in office, will be very ready to criticize the president in office for things that often the Congress is responsible for. The whole point is here, though, they're in the Congress. They're not co-presidents. Remember, however, then when President Clinton was elected, part of the campaign was you get two for one that Hillary was going to be in effect a co-president. I may have mentioned before that Ronald Reagan had offered apparently the vice presidency to Gerald Ford and Ford responded on the condition I can be co-president. Ronald Reagan wasn't about to put up with that. Division in the legislative branch is good, but not in the executive. Think about it. Just think about it. A legislature is supposed to make law for the whole country based on all kinds of different viewpoints. Members of Congress are there to represent those different viewpoints and to reach if they can a consensus or not to legislate if they can't re reach a consensus. But whenever they do reach a consensus and enact a law that the president signs, then it's time to execute. But that doesn't happen in this country. What happens is these things get kicked, yes, to the executive branch, but not to the president other than signing it. And then the bureaucracy makes up whatever rules the Congress should have made up, and they become subject to notice and comment. So what do we have then? We have another set of what should have happened in the first place. Instead of deliberation in Congress, we now get unelected bureaucrats deciding which comments they're gonna take into account and modify what they propose. That is not self-government. They often promote deliberating and circumspection and serve to check excesses of the majority. That is not happening. That's why we don't have the Constitution fully functioning as it's supposed to. In a plural executive, who says the buck stops here? That's a problem. As he says down here, I was overruled. This is if you had a plural council. I was overruled by my council. The council were so divided in their opinions that it was impossible to obtain any better resolution of the point. For those of you who have not yet been out in the business world or the academic world or some world where you have to deal with other people making decisions, you will find this out at some point in your lifetime, at some point in your career. The reason we say that committees don't normally work is that very thing. The Congress was designed to make committees work and they knew from the Constitutional Convention that it could work, but it has to be properly structured to work. Prevents knowing whom to censure. You don't know. You don't know when there's more than one. Because even though Congress is not supposed to delegate lawmaking to the executive branch, when it does enact a statute, is it is delegating the statute for execution by the president. So first, the restraints of public opinion, which lose their efficacy as well as on account of division of censure attendant or bad measures among a number. It's hard to censure the Congress. The only people you get to censure will are those who are running in your district as members of Congress, the House, or those in your Senate. You can't censure the rest of them but at least you can attempt to find out what they did. How do you find out what more than one person executing power does? See, often times members of Congress will say, we can't do anything, the executive branch is doing this. But wait a minute, you did it and you gave it to the bureaucracy to do it so you could avoid accountability and they're not accountable because they're not elected. A republic, not like the British Constitution, which has a council. We don't need one. In a republic, 
where every magistrate ought to be personally responsible for his behavior. That's what it's supposed to be. Further down, Republican jealousy, which considers power as safer in the hands of a number of men than a single man. That's the anti-federalist view of republicanism. It's very different, at least on these points, from the federalist. Okay, federalist 74. The direction of war requires a single hand. Of all the cares or concerns of government, the direction of war most peculiarly demands these qualities which distinguish the executive power by a single hand. In an amazing move, the Speaker of the House called the head of the, uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff totally out of bounds, absolutely out of bounds. That is not within the authority of the Speaker of the House. And now the Speaker of the House is maintaining still the National Guard around the Capitol, which is supposed to be open to the public. This is outrageous what's going on. Fortunately, some members of Congress, bipartisan members of Congress, are objecting to this. And people, if there's enough pressure, it'll have to change. But if this precedent stands for very long, we have got a dangerous precedent going forward for the use of the military in, internally in this country for purposes that it has never since the Civil War been used. Okay, Sophia, there, is, there are often critical moments when a well-timed offer of pardon, she's talking about pardons, I didn't put it in the, the selection that I um, went to from this section, because for one, I thought that the first one was the most important, but also I didn't think we would get through, but apparently we have more time than I thought. Um, I thought this was an interesting purpose of power, particularly because we don't see much of that purpose being applied today, particularly presidents have used the pardoning power for selfish reasons. Well, I assume maybe she's referring to uh, President Trump and the, the pardons that he gave to people that he knew, Bannon, for instance, and Flynn, et cetera. Okay. It may surprise many people, but in a study I saw before those last pardons were made, and there weren't that many at the end, President Trump had issued far fewer pardons than most recent presidents. Well, why don't the people know that? Because in the past, the media hasn't publicized what pardons have been given. Now, one of the reasons to give a pardon is to do justice where there has been injustice. And anybody who has watched what was done to General Flynn has to say it if their objective was a great injustice. Why? Under separation of powers, the prosecutorial power is left exclusively in the executive branch. When the executive branch decided on its investigation that the prosecution of Flynn was unauthorized, that should have been the end of the matter. But a district judge took it on himself to decide that wasn't the case. In an extraordinary move, he appoints another former judge to come in and assess. I mean, this is way out of bounds to the authority of any federal judge, any federal judge. So at that point, the only way to do justice was to issue the pardon. The Bannon thing was as political as you get. There was no basis at all for the charge, none at all. The story in the media was bogus. I looked at the indictment. I looked at the, the rebuttal to the indictment. 
It didn't matter. It was political. The problem is that unfortunately, we have a lot of politicization in the executive branch. It is in the bureaucracy. I'll never forget this. When I was a senior in law school, I interviewed in the Justice Department with the chief of the fraud division. This was during the Nixon administration, and it was before Nixon got into deep trouble. And what he said to me, I'll never forget. He said, pointing up upstairs, he said, those people think they run this place. No, they don't. We run it. That is completely out of bounds. Out of bounds because the president has sole authority over the executive branch. That's what's going on in this country. We have rebel units, essentially, in certain executive agencies that are undermining the Constitution. If you don't like the president, then quit. Or if you don't like him, at least you can do your job, do your job. But don't sit there and undermine him. And Congress has been able to undercut this by the way they use the advice and consent power. So for instance, in the State Department, and I know this, the State Department, almost nobody was confirmed in the State Department until the last year. Why? It's all about money. The money was going to left-wing groups. And once the new appointee came in, it was a possibility that that money, millions of dollars would be cut off. Look, Years ago, when I worked in the Justice Department as a consultant, it was very clear what that back then we called the Iron Triangle. And that is, there's a link between certain members of Congress, the media, and the people who are theoretically non-political appointees in various agencies. So if the under, if the under the people who are not presidential appointees do not like what the presidential appointee is doing. They create a story and they feed it and they work with members of the Congress. I was in an agency where what happened was that, I may have mentioned this before, that the, the White House ordered 300 people fired. They fired them and then they brought them back. When the appointee came in, then he started finding other things. And what were the other things? Well, he was being told by his general counsel that there were certain things he couldn't do, that they were illegal. So he sent me the statute and I read the statute. And I said, that's nonsense. He went back and the lawyer said, I wrote the statute. I mean, the regulation, that's what I meant. That's what it means. Now, how could he get away with this? The committee or subcommittee that had oversight of that office the chief of staff was the wife of the lawyer in the office. That's how things work in many places. People have no idea about what's going on because the media doesn't tell you. The media just doesn't tell you. I've got a few minutes left. And because of that, there's a lot in the judiciary to cover in our next last class. So I actually want to give an introduction to that since I'm basically through with the presidency, except on this point. When Reagan was reelected or before, uh, Professor Larry Tribe at Harvard wrote um, a book called God Save the Honorable Court. And he was fearful that President Reagan would be able to get too many appointments and change the court. And in the course of that, he argued for a new understanding of congressional power, that is senatorial power with regard to the courts. And that power that the Senate has with regard to the appointments has shifted dramatically since the 1960s. The relationship. There was always in a sense and should be a certain quote political element with regard to the appointments of judges and justices. You go back to Washington's time and 
the question was whether appointees to the courts were loyal to and agreed with the Jay Treaty. And those who didn't were not, and one of them, I forget who it was, was not confirmed because he didn't. And through the 19th century, there were occasions in which the Senate simply didn't move on nominees. You know, a lot was said that Merrick Garland it was inappropriate for the Congress, for the Senate, that is, to not move his nomination. That was done several times in the 19th century. Whether it is a good thing or not, it is the power is there. But even beginning in the 30s, this would happen more frequently. But when it did happen, they always argued and tried to find something legitimate to argue why the person was not qualified. When I was in law school, when Nixon was president, the leader of all of this was a senator from Michigan named Phil Hart. And I'll never forget when he came to the law club and addressed us, they had just beaten back uh, Nixon's first nominee for a particular seat. And then he had a second nominee and um, Senator Hart said, well, the only thing we can find on him is that he's stupid. Okay, that was a legitimate reason to oppose him. It, they did oppose him, they beat him. It was a good thing they beat him. Later on, he was charged with some uh, offense, sexual offense. In any event, there is certainly a purpose in all of this, but the idea that the Senate is to pick the nominee to the Supreme Court or lower courts is something that many senators believe in, not just Democrats. Some Republicans have been known to think that they really should be able to pick Court of Appeals judges. And there were instances during the Trump administration where one or more senators tried to do that. Now, it's one thing to consult with the senator as a matter of courtesy and support, et cetera. But the choice is the president's. On the other hand, senators, both Republican and Democrat, do insist on controlling district court appointments. They all want to do that. It's a matter largely of patronage, giving judgeships out to those who have supported them. So when you talk about selfish motives, Sophia, welcome to government. <laughs> that is, you're gonna find selfish motives everywhere. Remember, the Federalist is not naive. What it does is try to get people who are inclined to do things for self-interested reasons and yet make them work for the common good, whether they want to or not. They're forced to do it. Now, that emphasizes the importance of a unitary executive. It is difficult even for a single man or woman as president to buck a very strong Congress. But if you are able to split them, divide and conquer them from the Congress, that's a totally separate situation. So attempts to undermine the presidency, which is something that Justice Scalia emphasized in his selection of cases when he did his course on separation of powers was to show all the ways in which people are unaware of how the Congress has actually weakened, not the bureaucracy, they built that up, but how it has weakened the presidency. Now, that, you know, is going to end our section here on the presidency. But as we move into the judiciary, I want you to hopefully pay attention with what we've already said, especially about the 17th Amendment, how it is that we have had so many Supreme Court justices since the New Deal who have very much tilted against the states not just on race relations, but on all kinds of issues. Why do they do this? Well, they no longer represent the states. And we'll see and talk about what those consequences might be. 
Thank you for attending again. Next week will be our last session in this series, although we're already planning another um, series of sessions like this in the fall. So th thank you for attending tonight. Good night. Thank you.